Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. Listeners, we've got one of my favorite all-time guests returning this week. It is the Dutch chess legend, Grandmaster Jan Timmen. Of course, he was an elite player in the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s. He played Anatoly Karpov for the FIDE World Championship in 1993. Uh, Nine-time Dutch champion. He's also a prolific and renowned author. His 2017 book, Timmen's Titans, won ECF Book of the Year. It's also a personal favorite of mine. His new book, The Best Games of Max Uwe, is fairly self-explanatory in terms of what it covers. He reviews the games of his Dutch compatriot and mentor, uh, fellow Dutch chess legend. Uh, There's some beautiful games in it. It is a highly worthwhile book that you will hear us discuss momentarily. We also discuss the modern chess scene and Magnus Carlsen and Hans Niemann, and he tells some great stories as always. So it's always such an honor to get to hear Grandmaster Jan Timmen talk chess. And we will get you to that momentarily, but I wanted to give a shout out to our presenting chess education sponsors, chessable.com. They continue to roll out new courses, including Simplified, The Carol Khan by I am Alex Bonzea. I also wanted to give a shout out to Maurice Ashley's highly regarded course, Secrets of Chess Geometry. And you can check out my own recommended courses, which I will link to in the show description. Did want to mention, uh, as Again, YouTube listeners probably have figured out, but or YouTube viewers, but this one is audio only. When I do interviews with Grandmaster Jan Tim, and we usually do it with me calling him on the phone. So we will be back to the video format next week. But in the meantime, uh, please enjoy this. As always, fascinating interview with the Dutch legend of chess, Grandmaster Jan Tim. And here it is. And we are here with the legendary Dutch champion and award-winning author, Grandmaster Jan Timmen. Jan, it is a pleasure to speak again. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, it's also my pleasure. And I've been enjoying your new book, as I do all of your books, this one about the world champion, Max Owe. Um, And you've written, so we should be clear for listeners, this is a game collection, and there's some beautiful games in this. I really enjoyed checking out this book, but... There's not as much prose as some of your more recent books. And in fact, you say in the introduction that for your personal recollections of Max Uwe, you should go to your classic book, Timmons Titans. And I thought it might be fun to start off with your first encounter with Max Uwe, which, correct me if I'm wrong, but you played a simul against him in The Hague when you were 11 years old? Yes, that is correct. Yeah, yeah, true. So what are your memories of that specific encounter? Well, actually, he was younger than I am at the moment. So, uh, <laughs> but I, of course, considered him as a very old man at the time, which is kind of quite understandable. But I, of course, I had a lot of respect for him, and uh, I, I got to know him. Uh, of course, but no, I, I didn't know him at the time. But of course, he knew my um, my parents because my mother um, got uh, the math- mathematics at school. Uh, so, so he was. Uh, she was one of his pupils, and my father also knew him from the mathematical center in Amsterdam because my father was a mathematician, so as Erbe was. So, and I, I got to know him uh, better when uh, I was about eighteen years old. You describe the game a little bit. Um, and share what you recall of it. Share some details from your older brother playing against him. Um, do you have any other recollections of that specific Simo? I mean, he must have felt larger than life at the time. Yeah, that is true. Yeah, no, I, I remember that um, when uh, when I played him. Of course, I played a bit timid, and and he got an advantage. And um, but uh, so somehow he uh, let it slip away, and then uh, he offered to draw, and that uh, I was very happy with that. Of course. So, I uh, actually I played him another time. It is not in my book, Tim on Titus, because I I didn't remember that time. But there was a game that we played Blitz in 1971. We played both in the uh, Dutch Blitz Championship at the time. Uh, somewhere I think it was in Hilversum, and uh, so I I saw the photo. That we were playing blitz, and then, and then I remembered it was a, a game. In this time, I had white, and uh, it was a open Rui Lopez. I could see it from the <laughs> from the picture. Is that the photo that's in the book? No, no. Actually, I, I didn't choose that photo to be in the book because, uh, uh, well, it, I thought it was a better photo. 
Actually, I, in that Blitz Championship, I won the game and I won the championship, and he awarded me the first prize, which is also, that's also a photo of that. But in the book I chose for a photograph from 1979, we saw each other quite often then, because he was also a part of the Timan Committee that helped me in my fight for the world championship. And he was very instrumental in that. And he, uh, yeah, he, he, we were on very good terms at that time. Okay, yeah. And by that point, he had already been FIDE president. Yes, yes. He was already ex FIDE president at the time, 1979. Okay. And in your follow up encounters that you described prior to his being uh, FIDE president, um, at you know, you guys were born 50 years apart, probably the, the two most famous Dutch players in history. At, at what point did you start to develop a sort of a personal relationship? I think we we started to develop this relationship in 1971, just around the time when uh, when we played this Blitz game, because I was also um, involved in some other projects. Like I went to a, a training camp in the Soviet Union, which was arranged by him, and uh, we saw each other on uh, different occasions. And uh, of course, I got to know him very well. Uh, that's around 1976, when I grew stronger and I was in, uh, getting involved in the world championship. Okay. And what are your memories of this training camp in the Soviet Union? Well, actually, he was, of course, not, he didn't join me there, but uh, I went to uh, Tbilisi to uh, to play a tournament, and then I had to spend some days in uh, in Moscow. Uh, a training from Kassin, Alexander Kassin, who uh, who died not so long ago. Okay, and were there other students there as well, or was it primarily... No, I was alone there. Okay. What was that like? So you were about 19, 20? How old? How old? Yes, I was 19 years old at that time. Yep. I had actually... Uh, there was also another... Uh, they had some sort of training fund for, for young players, uh, which, which was sponsored by someone, and uh, basically all this was arranged by over that... Uh, youngsters could go to uh, the Soviet Union uh, for, for this training camp. I think that after me, Van der Stern was also uh, selected to do that and also got in touch with her about that. Okay. And of course, obviously, the legendary Soviet chess school, quote unquote, has come up a lot on the podcast. I've gotten to interview a lot of uh, Soviet emigres, and they talk more about the culture than the curriculum. Was was the instruction you got when you went to this training camp, was that markedly different than how you had been approaching chess in the West? I don't know. I don't think so. Actually, um, I think that Alexander Kasin was just a very nice man, but uh, I, I don't think that uh, they were very keen uh, on learning me some specifics about uh, how to train best or how to play very well. I don't think so. Okay, yeah, that echoes what Alex Yermolinsky said, that it was more about the sort of, that it permeated the atmosphere rather than the, than that you were actually being taught secrets. Um, yes, of course. Now, that, that, that was really not the point. I, I think that for me, this time was more memorable from what I experienced than from a chess point of view. So uh, could you elaborate on that? Well, I just I was in the Soviet Union, basically, for the second time, actually. And uh, yeah, yes, I, I got to know people. And uh, it's just a whole uh, different atmosphere, different sort of life that I didn't know very well from the West. But the people were very, very nice that I got to know. And at that age, uh, were you already speaking English so well as you do now? And did you speak any Russian? No, I didn't speak any Russian, but my English was uh, more or less okay, if I remember well. And was it? I think, were you able to get around okay with English? Yes, because in general, I, I traveled a lot already since I was uh, uh, 16 years old. So I picked up a lot of English on the way, and German, of course, as well. And uh, With some people, I spoke German in, uh, in uh, the Soviet Union. And were you able to have any fun on that trip? It strikes me as quite daunting, you know, 19 years old, don't speak the language, uh, sort of a an intimidating uh, government structure. Uh, what are your personal memories of that trip? Well, yes, I just, as I said, I got to know uh, 
the people that uh, that uh, were very kind to me. Glad to hear so it. That, <laughs> yes. And bringing it back to to Max Orway, uh you write in Timmons Titans of the book with a blue cover as a kid that this was a formative chess book for you, a game collection of his. Um, so what specifically do you remember about reading that book as one of your first chess books? The, the main thing that I remember were actually the diagrams because uh, I didn't really uh, play through all the games, but I, I, I just looked at the, the games and, uh, and the text of course in Dutch and, uh, that that was very instructive and very interesting for me. I knew uh, Irwin's books because my father had uh, the whole collection of books of Irwin from before the war. He had this series of openings books, they were all from 1938, if I remember well, and also, of course, this book on uh, on Irwin. There was also um, uh, 300 Charpatien from uh, Taras. And all these books were available uh, at my uh, parents' home. So I never had a dull moment when I was studying chess. And did you spend a lot of time reading these books? Yes, that is true. I also liked uh, 300 Charpatien by uh, Tarash. And were you generally getting out of chess set when you read these books? Uh, I think I, I uh, I learned quite a lot, yeah. But were you playing but through I the moves? I think the most of, uh, of the of the book about about winning games. Okay. This was a a, a game uh, a book in the, in Dutch. It was translated into Dutch by uh, by Hans Müller. It was originally in German. And a lot of the games, correct me if I'm wrong, but in those days the annotations were typically pretty light. Correct. Yes, that is true. Yeah. And of course, I had the, the, the chance to check them now, and the, the, the computer sees completely different things from what people thought at the time. Right, and I know that you, you've done that with, with Max Owe's games as well. What, was the, so what would you describe as the sort of overall judgment of the computer of, of his games? Of course, I used the computer also to select the games, to make a careful selection. And I discarded some games that uh, that are quite well known, which I believe were not really his best games. For example, against uh, Snosko Borowski, where he is black and he wins by a combination. But I think the the, the play was not, not very convincing in the middle game, because uh, both players didn't really know how to handle the Scheveninger. A variation of the Sicilian. So I had to uh, to drop that game, which was, of course, a, a bit difficult, but uh, there was nothing to do about it. But even I didn't know if I needed the computer to find out that the game was not very good. Uh, on the other hand, I, I found games that uh, were surprisingly good and uh, that I didn't know. For example, a game that he uh, beat Fasha Pirch. You can find it in the book. It's in, in the last chapter after the war. And you reference the website Chess Metrics a couple times as you're comparing uh, players. Um, how do you think about sort of as in this modern era, the sort of quantitative, our ability to try to quantitatively evaluate players? Do you do you find that useful? Yes, I think so. Of course, it, it, it is not always uh, accurate, I believe, but what the what chess metrics do, but but, but it is the only way uh, we can have a, a a picture of the of the of who was the strongest at the time. I was a bit surprised, to, for example, by by uh, the fact that that Maroxi was the strongest player let's say, in the beginning of the previous century. Also, I was surprised that Bogolyubov was doing so well. Yeah, you you wrote that he was the strongest. Was it the late nineteen twenties? Yes, yes, he he had some very good results and he won some big tournaments. But in, in general, I don't I don't think he was such a great player. Yeah, it, it's um it's fascinating to to go through that, and it is interesting how perceptions get formed. Of course, um, a major one with Max Owe being that he's um that he's 
one of the weaker world champions. Do do you find that after having done this extensive study, do you find that to be a fair characterization? It's hard to say. I think that all world champions were really strong. But of course, he was living in the time of uh, Capablanca and other kind who were really incredibly strong. And uh, apart from him, Lasker was also quite strong. Uh, I've had a lot of uh, difficulty to play Lasker. He lost three times against him. And uh, and we had a question from a Patreon supporter of of the podcast, Marco Bulatovic. Thanks for supporting the pod, Marco. And uh, on that note, he also asks, like, what contributed to that notion? Uh, your Dutch compatriot Willie Hendricks has, of course, written about how sort of these narratives get written by showing up in one book early and then sort of being. Um, whether consciously or not, sort of parroted in subsequent books. Um, do you think that there was some of that with Orway? Well, I think that that there was just very little known about Irish games. Uh, there were not so, so many commentaries uh, apart from the, the book uh, From My Games, which actually went only to 1937, the second match uh, against Aljekain. Uh, and I believe that his career afterwards was also quite interesting. For example, the, the match that he played against uh, Bogoljubov in Karlsbad 1941. He was criticized for that because that was, of course, ger- German-occupied territory. But uh, he played very well there. He was 40 years of age. And uh, I, I think that... Uh, he he was quite strong, and it, and also 1946, when he was already 45 years old, he played very well in Groningen. Yeah, and amazing that he was able to play at that level while while having a day job. Yes, yes, of course, yeah. Especially if you take into account that Botvinnik was 10 years younger, and he always won the tournament. Yeah, really impressive, and of course. Getting to the perception of Uruguay, a lot of it obviously comes down to sort of, <clears throat> excuse me, the the traditional narrative about the world championship match against Aoyakin himself, where everyone, uh, where it's commonly argued that uh, that Aoyakin was excessively drunk the the entire time. Um, you address this this briefly in your book, but um, how do you evaluate that sort of uh, narrative? Well, I think that Aoyakin had a habit to drink a lot in general. And he got away with it. It didn't influence his chess uh, that much. Of course, once you, you get a bit older, this may uh, have a negative uh, influence. And you can possibly better cope with it when you're younger. But uh, uh, I, I, I always said that uh, other kind didn't drink more than he normally would. And, um, well, you must take into account that he at carte blanche in the Carlton Hotel. Very clever move by the Uber committee <laughs> who organized the match. Uh, how do you mean? Like he had like an open bar? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Wow. He could drink whatever he want. And, and, he, and he did. <laughs> yes, yes, for sure. Yeah. But and, but he was used to that. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's that's definitely a, a point that I think you highlight well in the book, that that was just another day in the life for Aoyek, and there was nothing extraordinary about that that match. No, I think that, that basically in 1937, he, he probably had good reasons uh, to refrain from alcohol. Right. He probably had too much in his life. That, yeah. And then he cleaned up for, a, for, yeah. for the subsequent match. Yes. Um, let's let's talk a bit about uh, Max Uwe's playing style. I mean, you allude to this uh, proclivity for sacrifices on vacant squares. You say, as pointed out by uh, by Raymond Keen, um, and you know this famous knight f seven move in Zurich, and uh, of course r- rook h eight also in Zurich uh, against Geller, probably one of his f- most famous games of all time. Um, and, and there's definitely an, a creativity that's really striking as you play through these games. Did you ever have any, any conversations with Max about his approach to studying chess? Like, where do you think this creativity came from? Well, and that that's really a pity that he died at the moment when I 
I think I could still have had a lot of conversations with him. He didn't get very old. If you if you look at his uh, lifestyle, he only got 80 years old. So uh, and if he would have been older, I would certainly have had the opportunity to talk about that. But uh, I, I think he had a he had a very unique talent for chess, uh, and he also liked very much to play chess. You see a lot of pleasure. Just just look at the games and you see that he had a lot of pleasure playing. And you cannot say this about all uh, world champions. I think, for example, he had much he got much more pleasure out of chess than uh, Capablanca, for example. Interesting. And you you feel that you can sense that even playing through their games? Yes, yes. I, I think so. Yeah. I think Capablanca, you have the tendency you have the tendency to get bored. Uh, other kind was, of course, a different matter. He just lived for chess. He, uh, he, chess was everything for him. And, of course, you've written about so many other world champions. How would you compare uh, these gentlemen to, say, uh, Karpov? Completely different from Irvayev. Karpov simply uh, liked to play games. And Irvayev had a more uh, scientific approach, was much more interested in in opening theory, for example. And Karpov really uh, just wanted to play a game, like he would play any card game, and to be very good at it. And he had an excellent drive yeah, to, to be uh, the best, to beat his opponents. But you've written, didn't didn't work as hard as someone like Kasparov. No, no. I think uh, hardly anyone. Yeah, nowadays, of course, people work just as hard as Kasparov did. But nobody else did, I think, at the time, for my generation. And and obviously you've written about your personal interactions with Mikhail Ta. Uh, what, how would you describe his approach to, to chess? Not not over the board, but like how it fit into his life. I think that he, uh, he was completely hooked on chess. Of course, also some some other things, uh, women, uh, <laughs> alcohol, and uh, mostly uh, strong alcohol, just uh, hard liquor. And uh, he, chess was also part of that. But he, he lived for that. Yeah, he liked uh, to play, and he also liked to analyze. He liked to play blitz, and he um, he was very uh, yeah, adventurous. Let's let's put it this way. Yeah, seem- and you told quite well. Yeah, we had a lot of uh, conversations about all sorts of things. It was always very good company. Yeah, one one gets that that impression um, for sure. And w- another question on Max Irway that I think is important to to discuss. You write about in your book his propensity for making silly blunders. You quote him saying, "I've made more silly blunders than any other world champion." Uh, do you have any theories on why that was the case? It's very hard to explain. Yeah, I, I think that he uh, he must have been uh, nervous at some point. For example, when he uh, blundered against Smyslov in a winning position in the, the World Championship in 1948, there was really absolutely need, no reason to do that. It was a great game that he was playing, and he spoiled everything. And it's it's very hard to understand because uh, normally he would uh, be quite good in uh, accurately uh, calculating variations, but that time it just collapsed. And well, there are other examples, and I just mentioned a few. Of course, they didn't find their way in the book because uh, he just blundered these games away. For example, against uh, Lilian Tallinn. In 1937, in the Stockholm Olympiad, he he had a completely winning ending, and it was a very fine game, brilliant game. It's a pity he did that. He just spoiled everything. And uh, otherwise, this would also have been a great game for the book. But but you never... So you do have this quote where he admits or concedes that that he had... um, that he made more blunders than he would like. But did you ever either personally discuss with him or read anything where he sort of goes deeper into what the cause might have been? Well, yes, he uh, he wrote about it in uh, after the, the candidates tournament in Zurich. He wrote an article in Dutch 
And he, I don't know, he doesn't really explain why he blundered this game against Mislov, but he, well, he actually explained it a little bit. Yes, he said that he was uh, somehow uh, over optimistic. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yes, that was the main explanation that he gave. He thought, well, I, mean, I have already two out of two, which was actually quite uh, quite impressive. He was uh, 52 years old. He had just beaten uh, Kotov and Geller, and then in the third round he was uh, beating Smyslov. So he was at some point he uh, he just miscalculated. He just got carried away. He was over optimistic, something like that. But it's not typical for his uh, way of life or his, his style in life, uh, not at all. Right. You write about him being sort of a very meticulous guy, generally. Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, that's that's actually the way to say it, yeah. Yeah, it's it's an interesting dichotomy. And um, I, we have so many topics I'd like to ask you about. So to sort of close the loop on, on Max Orve again, I definitely highly recommend this book. I mean, the games are just a pleasure to play through. And as you suggest might happen, it did change my perception of him. Do you have a a number one favorite game after having spent, I know we talked about you working on this project back in 2021. So after having spent some years going through these games in such detail? Yes. Well, of course, I I still find the game against Gala. Gallup from the Candidates Tournament, really uh, very impressive with Rook H8. Yeah. And I saw now that uh, that in the new book uh, by uh, Settler, this this move gets a question mark, but I think <laughs> this is funny. wrong. And, and you cannot do that. I mean, <laughs> that's not the way to annotate uh, games, in my opinion. It doesn't matter what the computer thinks is the strongest move. This was actually the best move in the position, and it uh, won very quickly. <laughs> I think that was a great game. I also like, uh, of course, the, the, the Pearl of uh, Zandvoort, where he beats Alekhine, and the game against Nydorf. But some other games are also very good. I mean, I just uh, want to, to draw your attention to his win, for example, against Sultan Khan, which is a very unknown game. The game that I mentioned before against uh, Pitch is very good. These are quiet positional games that are very impressive. And you will find a lot of them. Against Jonah, there's a, there's a very impressive uh, technical game where he just outplays his opponent very uh, systematically. Yeah, I mean, the, the Pearl of Zanzivore, as you allude to, and the, the amazing Rook H8 move, like those, those tend to get more attention because they're, they're a little flashier, but... But... Yes, yes. <laughs> and I, but I like both the both Urbis. I like the Urbis who uh, wants to attack. And he really li- loves to attack. That is, that is quite sure. And I also like the Urbis who's very positional. We'll be right back to hear Grandmaster Jan Timmons' thoughts on the World Championship and much more. And we are back. If you don't mind, Jan, I'd also like to discuss uh, the World Championship. I know that you uh, gave a speech at uh, the Max Ove Center there uh, in Amsterdam, um, dis- or I believe you gave some game analysis, as is uh, what Erwin Lemmy told me as we did a postmortem of the match. Is yes, that correct? Yes, that's true. Yeah, I spent many hours there at the Ove Center, and it was fully packed, and uh, just trying to explain the the happenings in the the final game between uh, Ding Lier and in Nepal Miyachi. And it was an interesting game. Yeah. So this is the final classical game? Yes, that's true. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's return to the match in, this, in a second. First, I'd like to hear a bit more about the, the Max Orive Center itself, because um, I know it has a lot of photos. Were you, like, were you able to make use of uh, this center for any of your research? Uh, at the time when I... I uh, lived in Amsterdam. I went there quite often for research. But also, for example, when I was writing uh, books, for example, uh, The Longest Game, and, and also about Erwe, sometimes I would uh, just send them a message to look something up for me. Because I don't have all the material at home here. I have many books, and I uh, used uh, my library to write my books, but uh, it's not always sufficient. 
Yeah, that makes sense. Do you know any idea how many chess books you have? I'm sure some have uh, have passed through your possession over the years as I well. I think that I have uh, about uh, two and a half thousand. Oh, wow. That's impressive. That must be a lot of fun. Yes, I'm, I have all the books at the attic now. I just It's my library. And I'm now uh, doing a... Just doing a very systematic uh, research how how to put them just in the right order. Do you have a personal favorite from your collection? Um, well, yes. As I said, Trayon de Charpatien is a favorite. Also, uh, the book with uh, with Reti's, uh, studies is one of my favorite books. Okay, um, we'll have to yeah. check that out. And okay, so returning to the World Championship, in in one of our prior interviews, you mentioned being a fan of uh, Ding Lorenz playing style. Um, did you feel like this match was was representative of of his well, style? Well, in the beginning, he was uh, very uncertain. And he had to to get self confidence. Afterwards, we could see uh, that he, that he's really very strong, but he was still nervous from time to time, and this is really a pity. I believe that he can still become stronger if he's uh, focusing and if he's, if he's working very hard. Yeah, it it sounded in some post match interviews like he he now now that he won the world championship he sort of made it sound like now he would begin to get very very sort of professional. Which <laughs> yeah, now he wanted to become the strongest player in the world. I'm just the first world champion who said that. <laughs> Right. Because, yeah. uh, for example, uh, Petro Shan may have uh, had this feeling as well. Although he he actually won the candidates tournaments, of course, in '62. Uh, but uh, in the years of his uh, world championship, he was not. Uh, he couldn't prove that he was the strongest player. Now we have to see how Ding Liren uh, will do. But of course, he he shouldn't have played so soon after a world championship match. Same for Nepal Niachi. This is uh, they underestimated how much energy it takes. Yeah, I couldn't believe they were playing a tournament yes. five <laughs> five days yes, later. It's very hard. I know from my own experience mm. that it is very hard. You you need time to recover from such a such a match. Yeah, and it feels like these days there's so many opportunities to play. Like uh, probably in your day, there was a, a bit more of. Um, of a necessity. Yeah, that is true. Yeah, I, I, I didn't play so 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 much. Actually, especially not when I was playing these matches for the world championship. But of course, uh, things were completely different at the time. And what what other thoughts did you have about the world championship? Did you did you watch the match live? And um, did you know what did you think of the opening approaches? I, I'd just love to hear your big picture thoughts about this match. Yes, I, um, of course, I followed uh, followed the games live, yeah, and, uh, as I do with uh, all the major tournaments. I don't follow the, the rapid and uh, blitz tournaments, but uh, I, I follow the, the classical tournaments and also the match. And I, I thought it was interesting from an uh, opening's point of view. I think that there were, especially uh, Ding Lier had a, well, he had a lot of different ideas what to play. For example, his, his this game that he lost in the French uh, defense, he he was he played very well and he understood the French, although he hadn't played it before. I think something like it that is quite remarkable in the World Championship. Yes, yeah, certainly some some surprising choices um, from from my perspective, uh, and. How do you assess the the rest of the the world championship candidate cycle? Like, what do you think of um, Magnus's decision to step down? And uh, do do you think obviously he's as we record this on uh, Tuesday, June twentieth, he's coming off of a slightly disappointing tournament. Do you do you think he'll be able to regain his yes, form? Yes, I think that uh, he can do that, but it just depends on his attitude. Uh, I think he needs uh, focus. He needs motivation. And once he has his focus and motivation, he will uh, automatically start to work harder. What he said uh, after the game was sometimes, uh, well, I just wanted to avoid theory, otherwise he, my opponent would know everything. 
And that's not the kind of comment you must make. Yeah, but, uh, you can see that, that for example, a successful player like Caruana works extremely hard, although it's very hard to understand why he made that strange error in the last game against Nakamura. Yeah, that was surprising. I knew his position uh, quite well, and I knew that Black had very little to fear there. And there were six games, is it? So the, some, some very, something very strange happened. And I, I have no, no, not seen an explanation for that. But I, in general, a player like uh, Caruana, he's, he's working hard enough to win games. And you really need to do that. And uh, I think that uh, Carlson needs uh, to get some real challenges. But it's a pity that we still have this format of uh, candidates matches and the World Championship match. Because candidates tournament and World Championship match. I think that that would be much better if we had a World Championship tournament, 10 players double round. Yeah, I saw that yeah. you suggested that in your column in uh, New that, in Chess magazine. Correct. I was yeah. I was a bit I was a bit surprised because don't you? I, I personally, as a chess fan, like I really enjoy the spectacle of the one on one match. W would you miss no, that no, at all? No, I, I will, will. Yeah, no, I mean, I will also miss that. But the point is that I just see no other way of getting uh, Magnus back in the the fight for the world championship. Let's uh, let's give an example. He will play the World Cup. Okay, he might do that very well there. You don't win the world title if you win the World Cup. You get qualified for the candidates tournament, and I don't think he will play. And we will always be dissatisfied as long as he's he's there and he recovers from this bad tournament that he played. Uh, well, it's the same as uh, what happened with Kasparov. After Kramnik uh, became world champion, Kasparov continued to play very well, and there was no match between uh, Kramnik and Kasparov. That that is somehow uh, uneasy, but I think that once and we have uh, Carlson back as world champion, in that case, if there will be a tournament, then I think they should start playing matches again because the the other players like Gukesh will be a bit older. It will be a real challenge for the world title. Yeah, it's kind of um, a, an in-between period yes. right now. But Mag but Magnus has suggested some formats, some more radical than others. But like one, I recall seeing him suggest is instead of it being one four-hour game per day, two game 60 days per day so that it slightly lessens the amount of preparation that someone can bring to the table um, and allows you to play a, a, a match with more games. But of course, the quality would go down uh, with less time. What What do you think of suggestions like that? No, Jan? I'm uh, not very uh, uh, fortunate. No, I'm not very, very, very much in favor of that because I think in general, the uh, classical chess is is important to keep it. We have to keep it because it is just uh, the highest standard of chess and uh, it shouldn't be lost. If you look at uh, any games that are played uh, at the highest speed, the, the level goes down and it's really a pity. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and uh, of course he has he has written and said that he likes, he likes Fisher Random classical chess, um, but... I don't know. To me, that seems like too big a change. Do you do you agree for it to be the actual world championship? I don't like Fischer Random at all. I have no sympathy for for Fischer Random. I think it's a, just a mistake. I mean, uh, we, we should also realize that Fischer never played it himself. Yeah. <laughs> right. But I think in general we we <laughs> have this whole history coming from uh, the Middle Ages, from the Renaissance. Where the the order of the pieces is like it is, and there's a lot of harmony in there. Yeah. So even as someone who, as as we discussed in a prior interview, you've written that given the amount of preparation required, you're not sure if you would have been a professional under these circumstances. But nonetheless, you don't feel like the rules should be changed no. too much. Yeah, that's um, true. I, to... I probably I wouldn't be a professional. I would probably. Be... I've done something else in life, uh, writing books, because you don't need to, <laughs> to learn so much for that. <laughs> okay. And 
And we have a, a question on that theme from uh, Brian Karen, a uh, Patreon supporter of the pod and founder of the Facebook Chess uh, chess book collector group and Brian writes he says it's clear that modern GMs are stronger in the opening and other areas due to superior data and training tools but he wonders if you think there are areas of chess that grandmasters of your generation are nearly equal to or even better than modern GMs at. well I think in general uh, the, the top players of my generation and all the players were a little bit better in the end game uh, after uh, I can say this year, I wrote an article in New and Chess you may have seen about uh, Rook and Games yes. that were uh, played in in Vacancy. And too many mistakes, actually. And it's, it's quite understandable because at that time we, we had adjournments, we could study end games, and uh, we didn't have to play uh, just with a little bit of increment, incremental uh, eternity in one day. So it's different. I think for the middle game, it's hard to judge. I think we we should. Uh, it's really necessary to uh, to make a very uh, through uh, analysis of that and compare, uh, let's say, all the tournaments, all the matches with with tournaments of nowadays. But I, as far as I know, it has never been done very systematically. Uh, of course, the emphasis uh, of the older players of the let's say the classical era was different. There was much more emphasis on positional play. Well, now there's more emphasis on uh, sharp calculations. And uh, the general ideas of uh, of the past don't apply anymore. The computer just uh, has so many exceptions on this, uh, these ideas that we learned from uh, Botwinek and and, and other great players that it's completely different now. I find this very interesting to to see because I work a lot with computers also when I uh, analyze games from the from the present and the past for new in chess. Yeah, and I th I think I remember you writing that with with end games in particular, it can be difficult to. It's harder to understand what the computer is telling you. That is also true. Yes, I, I pointed that out. I, I spent a lot of time in general. I spent a lot of time to understand what uh, why computers have a certain judgment about about uh, games, or also about end game studies. When I make end game studies, I sometimes I simply don't understand what uh, what's going on, and I have to uh, go step by step. And then I can understand what what is deeply uh, hidden in the position. It's also this goes for games. It also goes for end game studies, and this I find it fascinating. Yeah. And so you mentioned top players perhaps not being as strong as end games, and I, I think it's very insightful what you point out about with adjournments um, in prior generations. There's a a very distinct reason and motivation to go to study end games in depth. But if a modern professional decided they wanted to make it a point of emphasis, how, what do you think would be the best way to study end games? I think in general, it's uh, the best way to study rook end games. I, I, um, I think that, uh, Evan Lamy told me this recently that Geary is now, uh, just spending a lot of time on end games. On studying end games, and also, and um, I, I noticed that, uh, for example, Magnus Carlsen must have spent a lot of time on end games because he's uh, he's quite good uh, actually, better than most other uh, top players. But I think also sometimes, well, it, it's just a general feeling that in the past we, players were slightly better because sometimes you see that, for example, Napoleon Miyachi, when he uh, beat Giri. In the candidates tournament of Bish Black, he won an end game that he had to uh, work out on uh, on the board, which was very uh, impressive. So I cannot say that it's a general rule that uh, in the past people were better, but uh, I think in general it, it's possible nowadays with uh, with the table basis to study all these seven pieces and games rook endings. And uh, just get the general feeling. And of course, we have also 
very good books nowadays by uh, John Nunn about these endings. Yeah, the the level of detail is staggering. Yes, in the, like uh, the Rook and yeah, Game John books. John Nunn did a very good job in general. Yeah. And then, of course, there's uh, Dvoretsky's Endgame Manual, which gets gets recommended here on the podcast uh, quite frequently. Um, ha have you spent much time with no, that no, book? No, no, because I, I, just from another generation, when I, when I studied Endgames, it was mostly uh, André Chiron and Averbach and uh, Levin Fisch and Schmichler for Hook Endings, although now most of, of this is not so relevant anymore. And in terms of obviously, Geary is known for his facility with with working with computers. Um, any guesses as he sort of tackles end games? Do you think he's trying to memorize table based positions or focusing more on understanding? Or how do, how would you approach it as a professional? Well, I, I must say that I I make a lot of end game studies now, and then I I'm also very busy studying end games uh, for obvious reasons, but. Uh, I try to do it for different purposes, not for uh, for playing, but just to to discover, discover beauty. But I, I, I'm not sure how I would go about it now if I if I would really be playing at top level. I would probably uh, find a way, but uh, I haven't given that much thought. It's probably better to ask uh, someone like Giri. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I think in general, Giri is a very good uh, technical player. When we come back, we will hear about Grandmaster Jan Timmons' next book projects. And we are back. And on a related topic, we have another question from a supporter of the podcast. This one's from Gerard Hart, who who writes, uh, you wrote the, the Art of Chess Analysis in 1997, and he wonders, with chess engines... Um, with chess engines now being updated, are you considering rewriting it for the 21st century? Yes, it would be an interesting idea, yeah. But there are always too many topics that I uh, want to write about. And uh, if, let's say, the publisher would ask me to do that, I would do it. And, and dare it could, I... Uh, Sorry, it go ahead. could give uh, some interesting uh, results, but uh, on the other hand, they, um, we were just looking at my my old book about Spassky Fisher in 1972, and we wanted to make a, well a new book with footnotes, and just keeping the old book. And I came to the conclusion that it was impossible. Huh. I would have to write a completely new book because there would be too many footnotes. Simply, or would these be based on the engine? Or yes, yes, on the engine. Yeah. Okay. And I know that you're you're just uh, you've just finished your current project, but do you have thoughts of uh, of another book or what might be next? Yeah, next book uh, will probably uh, book uh, be a book about end game studies. Oh, great! But not and also there will be. Um, uh, I have been working on a revised edition of the Art of the End Game, and I've added uh, sixty something like sixteen uh, extra studies. And uh, I have also corrected a lot of mistakes and uh, just added some more material. And uh, I hope that it will come out this autumn. That's exciting. I, yeah, bo both sound uh, fantastic. Um, and just to to cover one other question from a listener, um, you, uh, Chris Wainscott, friend of the podcast, asks for your best Lub Lubomir Luboyevich story. And Chris notes he's a character, and it seems like everyone from that generation has at least one great story about Lubo. Oh, <laughs> Lubo. Well, it's, it's not so easy to think of the of a story now. Yeah, just uh, some, something that, uh, that pops up. Yeah. He, I know Lubo could always get very excited, yeah. Lot of things, something small things sometimes. And you feature like, a game against him in uh, Timmons Triumphs. Yes, yes, he was he was very emotional sometimes. I, I noticed that he yeah he had this habit of uh, offering draws. Just uh, just when he got uh, excited, or for, sometimes for no reason at all. And would he do it like repeatedly within the span of one game or? 
Just no, 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 no. Just one, one moment. But also, once, once I remember that he played something in the Rue Lopez. He was right, and he came to me and he asked, "Is all Siri what I play?" And that was I found it very funny. <laughs> okay. And I said, "Yes, it is. it's very good when you play." <laughs> I didn't know what to say. Yeah. <laughs> um, and. Earlier when we were discussing the World Championship cycle, you may mentioned Gukash as a potential challenger. I know you've you've occasionally written about some of the young talents in your column. Um, is there? Do you have a favorite of the younger generation players? Yeah, well, actually, if Gukash, you just mentioned him. Yeah, he's one of my uh, favorites. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I would like to see him do well. Yeah, because he's a he's a very interesting player. What What's interesting about him? He has a lot of potential. He has a lot of ideas, and he uh, he's looking for the initiative very often, and he really goes for it. And uh, I like that very much. Uh, on the other hand, I must also mention other game, other people, of course, yeah, like Abdul Sattarov, who's also very promising. But uh, for the moment, Gukesh is my favorite. And I must also say that uh, although now he's not not always doing so well, but. I think that Hans Niemann is also a very interesting player. What, what What's interesting about his games to you? Yeah, he's also a player who's looking for initiative, new ideas. And he, he's not always succeeding, but uh, I think he can still make progress. Okay. If he gets to play top tournaments, of course. Right. What did you think of that whole controversy? Well, I think that... Uh, I, I don't see any proof that he has uh, uh, done anything unethical in a classical game. So, uh, so I don't don't see any point in discussing that. I have looked at games, but uh, no, it was not very convincing. He just uh, he be, he beat uh, Carlson fair and square, I must say, and there, there was nothing uh, wrong with that game. At some point, he missed the win. And uh, let Carlson come back. So I don't see a point of uh, of suspecting any full play there. Yeah, I I felt the same way. Now he has, as you mentioned, it would be good if he got um, more invitation to tournaments. I was glad to see. I don't know if you saw this, but he was uh, awarded the Sanford Fellowship here in the United States, where he's given a stipend to at least uh, pursue chess professionally. Um, <sighs> So I was glad to see that he's not blacklisted in that regard. Um, that was good, yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah. It's a very sad situation now, yeah, true. Yeah. Because he's uh, one of the very prom promising uh, young American players. Yeah. And he, as you allude to, he's been playing a ton. He just pl he just finished a tournament in Las Vegas. And before that, he was uh, playing abroad. I believe it was in Dubai and elsewhere. Um, and I saw someone suggest on Twitter that he's maybe even playing too much. And that made me wonder, do you think it's possible for like a 19, 20 year old rising uh, chess professional? Is it possible for them to play too much? Yes, I think so. Yeah. I think this, this may be a problem for him because you, you always need to have fresh energy, fresh ideas. And sometimes even if it doesn't matter what age you have, you can become exhausted. There's nothing to do about it. It shouldn't be too much chess in your head at some point. Interesting. So do you have a sense of what the optimal balance would be in terms of like how much classical to play per year? Oh, well, I think that uh, Bodwinik once said that you have to play a maximum of, of 80 games per year. And normally that was also what I did uh, in the past. And if you play 100, it's already a lot. Yeah. I guess especially as you get older, because when Neiman did gain, when he made his sort of legendary jump, hundreds of points in a couple of years, well, one thing is it was coming out of the pandemic, but he was playing like 150 games a year or more. I'm I'm not positive on the number. That is actually uh, excessive. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's good that he was uh, that he was young. <laughs> yeah, of course. Well, he's still young. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he can afford a lot to do to do a lot. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And, you know, a tangentially related question, you you mentioned that you don't you don't see evidence that he cheated in that game against uh, Magnus. Have have you ever played an over the board game where you felt that something foul was going on? Well, I, 
it may may have been, yeah. But I'm not sure. I, I just I never accused uh, anyone. <laughs> but, but you know, that during uh, open tournaments, well, uh, there are always possibilities to uh, cheat. And uh, the, the, the organizers can hardly take any measures against that. But, uh, well, what can I say? It's just not in the... Not in, in the past, of course, no. But but I think I think that it it may have happened. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it may happen uh, much more often than we think. Yeah, it's hard to know. Yeah. And yeah, and do you do you think you'll compete again at some point, or would you consider yourself re- retired at this point? Oh no, no, sure, certainly not. But uh, I don't see any tournaments to play at the moment. I, I, I I'm not very keen on playing open tournaments where I have to play. Two games a day. I wanted to play the Open Dutch Championship, but uh, it's it's taking place uh, end of July, beginning of August, and it's terribly hot in the playing hall. Oh, they have no air con. So, <laughs> for the time being, I see uh, no opportunities to to play something. But uh, if if something interesting pops up, I will uh, I will play. That's great to hear. We we would yes. love to uh, to see you back out there and. I, I had flagged another story I wanted to hear more about from Timmons Titans. There's always uh, so many, so many fantastic stories uh, that one can come across in your writing. And you describe uh, going to interview Gary Kasparov in 1997, and you contrast it with with the conversation with Karpov. Do you do you still remember what it was like? You'd mentioned preparing for days for this interview to discuss games with Kasparov. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, we uh, were basically discussing his games uh, against Karpo from these five matches that he played, and he had a very good uh, memory. Yeah, sure. Uh, I, it's, it's a pity I cannot find his material because it would be interesting to to see it again what he said, because only part of this was uh, emitted uh, was was just broadcasted in uh, the Netherlands in this television. Um, show that I had, but uh, it, it's really pity. I cannot find the material. But I was impressed by uh, by Kasparov, sure. Yeah, you, I mean, you, you said that without prompting, he just started um, spouting various variations from all of these games from many years before? Yes, that is true. And I, I did actually um, preparation for this interview, of course. I looked at games, and I hadn't written, of course, his book, uh, The Longest Game, yet. <laughs> that would be <laughs> written much later. But uh, but I knew I knew some things about the matches. But when he started uh, yeah, spouting uh, out variations, then it was a bit difficult for me. I just uh, had to let him uh, finish that. And uh, yes, it would be interesting to to, to see this material. I, I couldn't find it also when I was writing uh, The Longest Game. It would have been very helpful for me. And did you but once I, I get hold of it, I will probably write about it for New Chess. That would be great. We we would uh, lo- love to see that. And yes. Of, and of course, you played Kasparov many times. One of your most famous games being your your 1985 win against him, where basically there were, at the end of the game, you know, this is audio only, so I'm just trying to describe it for listeners. But at the end of the game, there's a pin, but then you have a cross pin on the 41st move with Queen F6 that causes him to resign and it's a, it's a beautiful tactic um and i'm i'm just curious if you, obviously it's rare that one tactically gets the better of kasparov i'm curious if you had a conversation with him about that if the clock was involved because you do uh annotate it in timmins triumph but you didn't expound on that particular game that particular moment that much well actually i think that he was not in time trouble or anything not not at all i think that he was just over optimistic and he wanted to uh, to impress uh, he wanted to play impressive moves but uh, as i i explained also in tim on is that i just uh, made a horrible mistake and i immediately realized this i overlooked something and that's actually also why i won the game otherwise it might have been a draw huh. But do you think he overlooked? But, but I, think, I think actually that I um, discovered that I played a very good game against him in uh, Manila 1992, this black. I played very well to a certain moment, also according to the computer, all the best moves. And I was completely winning with black. 
And then I started, uh, yeah, to make s- slight mistakes. And now when I look back at this game, I see that uh, that it was not so difficult to win the game. And finally, it was a draw. We'll be right back to wrap things up with Grandmaster Jan Timmen and hear about how he is using engines today. And we are back. And obviously, you mentioned you're using the computer a lot for your work with Endgame Studies, for reviewing Max Always games, um, and used it some in in uh, Timmons Titans, but um, and Timmons Triumphs, excuse me. How often do you sort of just do you ever just fire up the engine and look at one of your old games just uh, on a whim? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yes, that is true. Sometimes, uh, yes, I look at old games that I played just. Uh, Randomly, not for any. Of course, much much more uh, intensely when I was writing uh, Timon's Triumphs, then I needed to to just to find the best games, and it was a difficult choice sometimes. But uh, on the other hand, yes, I I learned a lot about all sorts of games that I played. Wow, it must be fascinating to to go through. Yes, I I, I love the computer. Yeah, it's it, it's really fantastic to look at old games. And do you do you try to have the most modern engine, or do you sort of feel like any any thirty five hundred level engine will do? Yes, I think that I, I have Stockfish fourteen. I can probably try fifteen, but I don't think there's much difference. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I'm, I'm happy now with uh, Stockfish fourteen, but but I must say also for Endgame studies, sometimes. Uh, also, Stockfish 14 is, uh, doesn't see the idea. And but then if you feed it the move, will it find it? Or Sometimes, for some reason, sometimes it's impossible for the computer to find the right move, I just, which I don't understand, actually. Huh. And But I will have to discuss this with somebody who, who has even a stronger computer. Right. I know you mentioned... Uh, um, Sending positions to Erwin Lemie in the past, and uh, yeah, that's true. I know, for uh, Tim on Triumphs, I, I uh, just sent him the manuscript, and he discovered some things. Uh, with uh, I, I don't know which computer he used, I forgot, but uh, he, he got some with some uh, improvements, which were very valuable. And are you playing around with the the neural net computers as well, the the Leela's, and I know some of the stockfishes obviously are are incorporating them now as well. Well, actually, no. I just um, one computer is, uh, is enough for me. Okay. But if it, but sometimes I look at the, what the old Fritz Twelve has to say about uh, certain endgame studies, but that's normally not so impressive. I mean. The, <laughs> It is really uh, important to have a very strong computer to to, to work on endgame studies. And and it's always a, such an honor to to speak with you, Jan. Um, one, one last topic. I'm just curious how you feel about the state of uh, Dutch chess right now. I know um, Anish is uh, doing quite well, consolidating and making a real push for the the candidate. Are there any other top young talents or top players that you're excited to track? Well, I, I, um, I think that Aileen Rubers is is is, is very promising. She was here uh, for some uh, for some training. I gave her two two afternoon training uh, sessions, and uh, I may do this uh, for some more training sessions in the future. But she's always traveling from one tournament to the other, so uh, it's not that easy. But uh, of course, Giri is a uh, is still a very uh, very strong, and Jordan van Verrees has been a bit disappointing, and I hope that he will be able to recover. But apart from that, I don't see any uh, very strong players from the the junior generation at the moment. But it may may change. And when you worked with uh, Aline Robers, what sort of uh, what sort of material did you present? Did you analyze games? Uh... Yes, I looked at some games that she played, and also I showed some games for myself. I showed some end games, end game studies that I that I found useful, and we, we did concentrate on that. And she was uh, accompanied by uh, Robert Riss, who is her trainer. 
Oh, okay. Um, you know him, yeah? He's yeah, I am. yeah, I'm familiar yeah. with his work, yeah. Yes. Um, excellent. Well, Jan, this has been a real pleasure, as always. Uh, the book, of course, is called The Best Games of Max Ure. Highly recommend it. Uh, anything else to discuss before before we say our goodbyes? No, I think we, we discuss a lot, yeah. So it's fine with me. Excellent. Well, I always appreciate your, the generosity of your time, yeah, and always look forward to the next book. So thank you so much, Jan. Really appreciate it. Okay, I, I'd like to do the conversation. Bye-bye.